I have been a general authority for over 30 years and a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for 22. During those years, I have interviewed, I don't know how many, surely thousands of members of the church and have talked with them in intimate terms of their worthiness, their sorrows, and their happinesses. I only mention that in the hope that the credential of experience may persuade you to consider matters which have us deeply worried. Today, I speak to members of the Church as an environmentalist. My message is not on the physical, but on the moral and spiritual environment in which we must raise our families. As we test the moral environment, we find the pollution index is spiraling upward. The Book of Mormon depicts humanity struggling through the mist of darkness and defined the darkness is the temptations of the devil. So dense was that moral pollution that many followed strange roads and fell away into forbidden paths and were lost. The deliberate pollution of the fountain of life now clouds our moral environment. The gift of mortal life and the capacity to kindle other lives is a supernal blessing. Its worth is incalculable. The rapid sweeping deterioration of values is characterized by a preoccupation, even an obsession, with the procreative act. Abstinence before marriage and fidelity within are openly scoffed at. Marriage and parenthood ridiculed as burdensome, unnecessary. Modesty, a virtue of a refined individual or society, is all but gone. The adversary is jealous towards all who have the power to beget life. He cannot beget life. He's impotent. He and those who followed him were cast out and forfeited the right to a mortal body. His angels even begged to inhabit the bodies of swine. And the revelations tell us that he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. With ever fewer exceptions, what we see and read and hear have the mating act as the central theme. Censorship is forced off stage as a violation of individual freedom. That which should be absolutely private is disrobed and acted out center stage. In the shadows backstage are addiction, pornography, perversion, infidelity, abortion, and the saddest of them all, incest and molestation. In company with them now is the plague of biblical proportion, and all of them are on the increase. Society excuses itself from responsibility except for teaching the physical process of reproduction to children in school to prevent pregnancy and disease and providing teenagers with devices which are supposed to protect them from both. When any effort is made to include values in these courses, not just values of the Church but of civilization, the protest arises you're imposing religion upon us, infringing upon our freedom. While we pass laws to reduce pollution of the earth, any proposal to protect the moral and spiritual environment is shouted down and marched against as infringing upon liberty, agency, freedom, the right to choose. Interesting how one virtue when given exaggerated or fanatical emphasis, can be used to batter down another. With freedom, a virtue invoked to protect vice. People who are otherwise sensible say, I do not intend to indulge, but I vote for freedom of choice for those who do. Regardless of how lofty and moral the pro-choice argument sounds, it is badly flawed. With that same logic, 
One could argue that all traffic signs and barriers which keep the careless from danger should be pulled down on the theory that each individual must be free to choose how close to the edge he will go. The phrase free agency does not appear in scriptures. The only agency spoken of there is moral agency, which the Lord said, I have given unto every man that he may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. And the Lord warned members of his church, let not that which I have appointed be polluted by mine enemies by the consent of those who call themselves after my name. For this is a very sore and grievous sin against me and against my people. Because the laws of man by and large do not raise moral issues, we are taught to honor, sustain, and obey the law, and that he that keepeth the laws of God hath no need to break the laws of the land. When a moral issue does arise, it is the responsibility of the leaders of the Church to speak out. Gambling, for instance, certainly is a moral issue. Life is a moral issue. When morality is involved, we have both the right and the obligation to raise a warning voice. We do not, as a Church, speak on political issues unless morality is involved. In 30 years and thousands of interviews, I have never once asked a member of the Church what political party they belong to. There are both moral and physical laws irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundation of this world, which man cannot overrule. For instance, do you think a vote to repeal the law of gravity would do any good? Suppose a law decreed that all children would be taken from their parents and raised by the state. Such a law would be wicked but probably could be enforced. Such things have been done before. But suppose an article of that law stated, within 15 days mothers will cease all emotional ties to her child. That provision is absolutely unenforceable. No matter how severe the penalty or the number of enforcers, it is absolutely unenforceable because it contravenes both natural and moral law. No matter if 15 weeks or months or 15 years were allowed, it cannot be enforced. It may work with animals, but all flesh, the scriptures teach, is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men and another of beasts. It cannot be made to work with human mothers, never. A man-made law against nature would be as impossible to defend as a law annulling love between mother and child would be to enforce. No greater ideal has been revealed than the supernal truth that we are the children of God, and we differ by virtue of our creation from all other living things. No idea has been more destructive of happiness. No philosophy has produced more sorrow, more heartbreak, and mischief. No idea has done more to destroy the family than the idea that we are not the offspring of God, only advanced animals compelled to yield to every carnal urge. Animals do not subject themselves to moral law. <clears throat> Nevertheless, while by and large they are promiscuous in responding to their mating instincts, their mating rituals have set patterns and rigid limitations. For instance, animals do not pair up with their own gender to satisfy their mating instincts, nor are these instincts expressed in the molestation of their offspring. The source of life is now relegated to the level of unwed pleasure, bought and sold, and even defiled in satanic rituals. 
children of God can willfully surrender to their carnal nature and without remorse defy the laws of morality and degrade themselves even below the beasts. If we pollute our fountain of life, there will be penalties exquisite and hard to bear, more than all of the physical pleasure ever could be worth. Alma told his son Corianton, Know ye not, my son, that these things are an abomination in the sight of the Lord, yea, most abominable, above all sins, save it be the shedding of innocent blood or the denying the Holy Ghost. The code for moral laws found in the scripture stated as simply as wickedness never was happiness. The scriptures speak in general terms, leaving us free to apply the principles of the gospel to meet the varieties of life. But when they say, Thou shalt not, we had better pay attention. The only legitimate employment of the power of procreation is between husband and wife, man and woman, who have been legally and lawfully married. Anything else violates the commandments of God. From Alma, if ye speak against it, it mattereth not, for the word of God must be fulfilled. It is a great challenge to raise a family in the darkening mists of our moral environment. We emphasize that the greatest work you will do within the walls of your own home and that no other success can compensate for failure in the home. The measure of our success, however, as parents, will not rest solely on how our children turn out. That judgment would be just only if we could raise our families in a perfectly moral environment, and that now is not possible. It is not uncommon for responsible parents to lose one of their children for a time to influences over which they have no control. They agonize over rebellious sons and daughters. They're puzzled over why they are so helpless when they've tried so hard to do what they should do. It is my conviction that those wicked influences one day will be overruled. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, and he never taught a more comforting doctrine, that the eternal sealing of faithful parents and the divine promises made to them for valiant service in the cause of truth would save not only themselves, but likewise their posterity. Though some of the sheep may wander, the eye of the shepherd is upon them, and sooner or later the tentacles of divine providence will be reaching out after them and drawing them back to the fold. Either in this life or the life to come, they will return. They will have to pay their debt to justice. They will suffer for their sins and may tread a thorny path. But if it leads them at last, like the penitent prodigal, to a loving and forgiving father's heart and home, the painful experience will not have been in vain. Pray for your careless and disobedient children. Hold on to them with your faith. Hope on, trust on, till you see the salvation of God. We cannot overemphasize the value of temple marriage, the binding ties of the sealing ordinance, and the standards of worthiness required of them. When parents keep the covenants they have made at the altar of the temple, they will, their children will forever be bound to them. President Brigham Young said, Let the father and the mother, who are the members of this church and kingdom, take a righteous cause and strive with all their might never to do wrong, but to do good all their lives. If they have one child or a hundred, if they conduct themselves toward them as they should, binding them to the Lord by their faith and prayers, I care not where those children go. They are bound up to their parents by an everlasting tie, and no power on earth or hell can separate them from their parents in eternity. They will return again to the fountain from whence they sprang. In the battle of life, the adversary takes enormous numbers of prisoners, and many who know of no way to escape are pressed into his service. 
Every soul confined to a concentration camp of sin and guilt has a key to the gate. The adversary cannot hold them if they know how to use it. The key is labeled repentance. The twin principles of repentance and forgiveness exceed in strength the awesome power of the adversary. I know of no sins connected with the moral standard for which we cannot be forgiven. I do not exempt abortion. The formula is stated in 40 words. Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. By this ye may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess them and forsake them. However long and painful the process of repentance, the Lord has said, this is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Civilizations like Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed themselves by disobedience to the laws of morality, for the Spirit of the Lord will not always strive with man. And when the Spirit ceaseth to strive with man, then cometh speedily the destruction. God grant that we'll come to our senses and protect our moral environment from this mist of darkness which deepens day by day. The fate of all humanity hangs precariously in the balance. And may we have the protection of him who is our Father and our God. And may we merit the love and blessings of his Son, our Redeemer, in whose name, even the name of Jesus Christ, I bear witness. Amen.